Hi everyone, uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you in person today, uh, but thanks for the opportunity to have a bit of a chat with you about some things that I've been working on, specifically historic Hansard. Um, now the slides that I'm going to be using today are available online, so feel free to have a look and play along, um, and they include all the links to the various things that I'm talking about, so you can explore um, afterwards. Okay, so the a uh, story I want to tell today is really how did I get here? Like, how did I end up creating my very own version of uh, Australian parliamentary debates from 1901 to 1980? Um, and as well as that, I suppose, point to a few of the possibilities for future research that uh, become available because you get great content like this available in digital form. So let's start. Now, uh, Hansard, uh, the Australian parliamentary debates, have been digitised by the, uh, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Library. Um, so they've digitised them, they've put them all online, they're all available through the Parliament of Australia website. And this is how you access them. Uh, unfortunately, all of Hansard is sort of dumped into their big database uh, called Parlinfo. Um, I mean, there's lots of fabulous stuff in Parlinfo, but it's not the easiest system to use. So it's not that easy to actually find and use Hansard within Parlinfo. Now, in particular, if you look at a, uh, say we find something, search and find something and click on it, and then we have a look at that item. So here's a little fragment of, of Hansard. And you can see that each uh, little fragment, each little speech uh, is presented within uh, a complex hierarchical structure, um, really deeply nested within that, that hierarchical structure. Uh, and that's fine if the only thing you're doing is, you know, just wanting to, to discover a particular uh, piece of text. But quite often what we want to do is read things in context. And the, the system available through Parlinfo just doesn't allow you to do that very well. It's very hard to actually get a sense of what's going on through across a whole day's proceedings. And that sort of context, that ability to sort of read things in that way is obviously, you know, pretty crucial uh, to the work of historians. Um, so what I wanted to do, well, no, first of all, I should say that although um, oh, it, it is difficult in that way to, to, uh, to look at things in context, there are some other pretty cool things about this interface. Um, and in particular, there is that little link at the top, um, a little button there, which says view save XML. So what they have done, and this is, this is really, really important, is that they've um, made the raw XML files, the marked up uh, documents from each day's proceedings, they've made that raw XML files, those raw XML files accessible to anybody. So you can click on that button and you can actually access that raw XML. Um, now, I probably don't need to explain what uh, XML is to this sort of audience, um, but if we just have a little look at some of the examples of what's going on underneath, um, you can see that each day's proceedings is marked up in a, in a very sort of standard format um, using XML, which identifies the structure of the day's proceedings. And in particular, it identifies particular uh, sections within the day's proceedings. So you can see you have a, a debate, and a debate is a container that, that includes a number of speeches. Um, speeches are given by particular speakers. Um, and of course, oh, and one thing to note about the, uh, the speakers that they've also done here is that uh, each speaker has a unique identifier. Uh, you can see that there. Um, so that's really important in making sure we know which speaker is which, because sometimes they do have the same names. Um, and uh, of course, as well as the speaker information, you have the text, what they actually said. So all of that is nicely structured there. Why is this useful? Um, well, obviously, it enables you to get more fine-grained search results. You know, you can search for something by a particular person uh, relating to a particular debate. Um, but also, you know, it's that ability to, to filter and aggregate the whole corpus of Hansard. 
um, to bring together everything spoken by a particular person or to bring together all the speeches in a particular debate across multiple days. You know, to bring that together, to open it up to large scale analysis is really exciting. And that's really difficult to do if you don't have that sort of structure in the first place. So, you know, a lot of time and effort was invested in creating those XML files, but they create all sorts of things. Uh, they make all sorts of things possible now in terms of research use. OK, so exciting stuff, all that XML. But we don't really want to go through the whole of the Parley Info database clicking on that Save XML button, do we? No. So what I did was I created a, a little script, a little program, which basically went across the whole of Hansard in Parl Info and downloaded all of the separate XML files so that we can have them in one big repository. While I was doing that, I discovered something a bit interesting. I discovered that quite a few sitting days were actually missing from Parl Info. And when I say missing, there was a record of them there, but when you actually downloaded the XML file, um, it was empty. There was no content in that XML file. And that meant, of course, because the XML files are actually used in the creation of the search index, it meant that those days, or the content of those days, just weren't showing up in search results. They were effectively invisible. How many? Well, um, I found 94 days that were missing. And as you can see by uh, this little chart here, it's not that there were 94 days missing spread across all of uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate uh, from 1901 to 1980. It was actually quite focused in the Senate around the World War I period. Um, and in particular, um, 21 of the 47 sitting days uh, in 1917 were missing. Um, so somebody who was using Pal Info to uh, do research into Hansard in the World War I period would have just been missing a significant amount of material. Now, the good news is I told the Parliamentary Library people they got onto it really quickly and it's all been fixed. Um, and I raised this really just for, for, to make two particular points. One is that search interfaces lie. Um, and I think it's really important for us as digital scholars to recognize that and um, to be critical of the search interfaces that we use, you know, to be aware of, of both what they show and what they hide. It's a really important skill which we should be developing and sharing as we use these digital resources. And the other point I wanted to make is that it's a great example of the fact that the best way for an organization to improve its data is to make it freely available to users. Um, the Parliamentary Library didn't know there was this problem, but they had made their XML files available so I could play with them and find that there was all this stuff missing. They could fix it. It's a win-win. Um, you know, as long as organizations can get over that embarrassment that, you know, there might be something wrong with their data, it's a really positive situation where we can all be contributing together to improve the sort of data that's available. Okay. So eventually all the problems were fixed. My script went through all of Hansard, downloaded lots and lots and lots and lots of XML files. Um, and they're all now saved within a GitHub repository. Um, so you can dive in there and download the whole lot and start to explore. And that's sort of where things stayed for a while. Um, you know, I created the repository, downloaded the XML files, created the repository, made it all available. But I couldn't quite get over that that question about um, you know not being able to read a day's uh, proceedings in context, not just being able to browse through the content, having to to click on all those little plus buttons and minus buttons to open up those little hierarchical fragments. So that's how I ended up creating Historic Hansard. Um, <coughs> and the site itself is actually pretty low tech. We'll just dive in and have a bit of a look at it. Um, so it's basically just a series of static HTML pages, lots of browse lists that you can go through. As I said, the whole point of this was to really make it easy just to browse, just to have a look at a day's proceedings. So you just go through a list of, of days and years, uh, of, of parliaments and years, and you can actually just 
look at the text. It's really not all that exciting, but as I've shown you, you it was just something you can't do within um, the, uh, the original interface made available by Parliament. But I did add a few little extra bits and pieces. Um, so there are a couple of extra indexes. So one for bills, for example, so you can actually look at the bills um, and it aggregates the, uh, the various appearances of those bills through the, the different readings of them. Um, it's not perfect because um, it's obviously the XML themselves are based on OCR of the indexes and there are still some OCR errors within those. Um, and I haven't tried to fix those at this point. But it still provides another entry point which just wasn't really there before. And similarly, uh, you can look at a list of people. So to see all the speeches by a particular person, um, again, you can look at those over time and jump in and have a look. And there's an error. You always find errors somewhere. So that's a problem with the uh, square brackets in the original XML. Um, Okay, so as you can see, the interface isn't very fancy, but it does enable you to do what it was intended to do, which is actually just read Hansard. Um, now, as well as those sort of new indexes, I incorporated a couple of other, um, what I think are pretty cool little features. Um, and I, you know, I can't really take credit for these because it's just a matter of integrating services that other people have created. Um, so there's two services uh, which uh, I've sort of added into Historic Hansard. Uh, one is Hypothesis. Um, I mean, both of which you've probably heard about before. So Hypothesis, which enables a is a you know web annotation framework. So basically, you can go to any web page and you can annotate it, you can highlight it, you can add comments, and you can share those annotations so that anybody else going to that web page can see them. Um, the other thing that I've included is Voyant, which is a text analysis program or web-based text analysis program. So to see how, uh, so um, Hypothesis is built in, so at any point within uh, a uh, 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 day's proceedings, um, you can just go over to the sidebar over here, you can log in uh, and you can highlight something or you can add notes and you can share those. And when I added that, I mean, one possible use I thought about was that it would be really interesting uh, from a teaching point of view to set as a, a class project um, annotating at say you know a particular year of Hansard to take a year and to mark up all the people and the events and the places and add links to other resources or pictures to create this sort of really rich annotated version of a year's Hansard. I it would make quite, quite a nice little project. And you can set up Hypothesis to have sort of closed groups, so it could be like a private thing within your class. You know, there's all sorts of possibilities you could do there. Um, and I'll show you another really cool use of Hypothesis in a minute, its ability to actually create links, not just to pages, but to particular fragments on a web page. But first of all, let's just have a quick look at what you can do with Foyant. Um, so if we're here at 1902, you can see we've got a view in Voyant link. Um, and what it does, it basically gets the uh, zipped up um, XML files, which are sitting on GitHub in that repository that I showed you before. And it feeds that whole file into Voyant. Um, and then Voyant, as you've probably seen before, creates all sort of neat visualization tools, which enable you to explore the text of, uh, of, of, of that corpus. Um, I won't go into any detail here because um, you've probably played around with Voyant before, but you could see how easy that was to feed a year into there and you could start to, to look at uh, you know, the keywords in context within that particular year. Okay, now uh, if we hop back here for a sec, I just wanted to show you my uh, the example of using hypothesis for direct linking to a particular fragment. So Oh, before I do that, uh, sorry, not terribly organized here. Let's just have another look uh, because when I originally created um, Historic Hansard, it didn't have a search function. Uh, you know, I thought that would happen at Parlinfo and I didn't really see that I needed to include my own. But of course, people kept asking me about search. So I ended up putting one in. Um, it's, uh, and again, it's not, um, it, you know, it's pretty easy to use, pretty familiar. We search for carrots and we find people talking about carrots. Um, 
So um, now one nice thing that I added here, well, I think it's nice. Um, you know, I often talk to organizations and people about the importance of making machine readable versions of their data available so that people like us can start to play with them and do interesting stuff. Um, so I thought, you know, I should live by my own rules. Um, so if you go down to the bottom of the search here, you see you have an option to download your search results as a CSV file. Um, okay, so now back to linking. Now, um, this is an article which was published in uh, an Australian literary magazine uh, in 2017. Um, it uh, is about hindsight. Um, so I thought it would be quite cool to... Um, let me just add my bookmarks to that. It would be quite cool to actually create links from here to historic hansard. Um, you can see there's actually no citations uh, on these quotes from Hansard. So let's put them in. Um, so I'm just using the hypothesis bookmarker here to uh, add um, hypothesis into this page. And we can see that stuff starts to happen. The quotes are now highlighted. Um, and if we click on one of these, we can see over here, there's the quote there, there's the information, the citation, and there's the link into historic Hansard. So if we then click on that, not only do we go to the page in Historic Hansard, to the day's proceedings, or even to the debate, we go right to that particular fragment of text. That is, I just think it's so cool, that we can actually create these really rich, deep links into particular bits of, of, of large text documents. And it goes the other way too. So if you click on that link, you go back to see uh, that quote in, in the context of the, uh, the Mianjin article. So that's one of the really neat things that you can do with Hypothesis. Basically, you just highlight a piece of text. You, uh, um, can, you then get a shareable link to that particular text fragment, and then you can share that however you like. OK. Now, uh, <coughs> just a couple of examples of things I've done with the Hansard repository. Um, so this was just a little demo that I did for uh, a symposium. Um, and it's focused on the 1970s, so it's not the whole lot. Although I did do a thing here where uh, I did um, calculated TFIDF values for words by year and created these little word clouds, which are based not on frequency, but on TFIDF values for each um, decade. Um, and so the words that you see, of course, are the words which are significant within the context of that particular year. Um, so most of them are not actually very familiar because they were things which were talked about a lot at that particular time but weren't talked about much about uh, in other decades. Um, I also just did some sort of comparisons of, of words. So I took a bunch of words. I was working with a, another historian. So he was feeding me a sort of lists of words that he was interested in uh, and I was just sort of feeding them in to see uh, how they varied over time, creating these little bubble line charts. So that's just all based on that uh, those XML files that I'd harvested and then done a bit of processing on. One interesting thing that I like here is the people. Um, so uh, not only looking at their, you know, when they spoke, how much they spoke, the number of words they spoke, when were their most verbose days. Uh, but I had a little go at doing uh, calculations of similarity between blocks of text. So I aggregated all the text for a particular person and then compared them to all the aggregated texts of all the other people to see who they most were like. Uh, and uh, so then you can sort of view that and see who was most similar. Um, and because uh, in most cases you do actually see the party of people that's included in the XML files, you can sort of see that it's not necessarily people from within their own party that they're, they're, they're what they say is most like. Um, so there's some interesting questions that come out of that. Um, something that I did just recently is uh, I um, uh, had a look at the contexts or the occurrences of the words aliens and immigrants across a number of large text repositories, including Trove's digitized newspapers and Hansard. Um, 
And uh, one thing I did here was I actually started with uh, that CSV from the search results that I showed you. So that gave me a sort of filter so I didn't have to process the whole of Hansard. I could use that, that those search results uh, to point me to the, the days that I knew included those words and just focus on those. And so then I just ran you know, a regular expression across the, the, the text to find the word aliens and to pull out the word that occurred before aliens to, uh, to get this sort of data out. Um, if you want to see, you know, why and how this all comes together, there's a link there to, uh, to the, the complete talk that I gave uh, about this. Um, you know, I'm a big believer that when we approach sort of large data sets, it's important to have a bit of a play. The play is a, a legitimate research strategy when it comes to working with large uh, uh, data repositories. So um, I don't think I played around with were interjections. Now, as I showed you within that really nicely structured XML, you had speeches and debates and all that sort of stuff. You even have interjections marked up in the XML uh, within a particular speech. So that if somebody's talking about you know, some uh, important thing and in the middle of it somebody yells out, rubbish, that's marked up as an interjection. So I thought, hmm, it would be interesting if I could pull out all of those interjections. So I did, and I created another little data set here that you can play around with to look not at the speeches, but at the interjections. Um, of course, once you've done that, <coughs> you start to think, Oh, what else could I do? And uh, it occurred to me that interjections were a bit like tweets. You know, they were short and pithy and pointed. And so I thought, uh, as you do, well, what would happen if I made them look like tweets? Uh, and uh, I created uh, this thing. Uh, and uh, what this does, this site, it basically just pulls um, things at random from the interjections or interjections at random. Um, or you can filter them by keyword, and it just loads them if, as if they were tweets. So the words, the speakers, the dates, they're all real. The sort of other activity stats down here, they're made up. But it's amazing the number of times you actually, you know, they actually seem to be having a conversation across time. Um, uh, yeah. So it's uh, it's and you know it may it does make you approach the data in different sorts of ways, which I think is the value of starting to play around with things. And of course, having got to that point, I had to take it one step further. So uh, I actually created um, a uh, Robo Hansard. Um, Robo Hansard was just a little experiment using a you know a little Raspberry, Raspberry Pi, like a you know sixty dollar computer, and I loaded all the interjections on that and um, created an interface which pulled up uh, the interjections and fed them through a speech processing uh, program. <coughs> and this is what we ended up with. Uh, sorry about the audio, it's a bit choppy. Capturing, uh, capturing the, the screencast from the Raspberry Pi was a bit of a, bit of a challenge, but you get the idea. Um, so you just um, basically type in a particular word to kick things off so that they've got something to talk about. Uh, and then they start. This amendment Queensland producers would have to send only good pineapples and bananas to the other states. The government has arranged for fresh pineapples to end up in the people do not forget the assistance that is given to Queensland in connection with the sugar banana. Which do not grow on rich soil. If the country in the BMLM district be voted for it and the production pineapple reason is that it has such a climate that it can be entitled the same of the year. And you see, you can interject in various ways uh, by uh, using the shame button or the hear here button if it's something that you like, and you can also hear interject from the public gallery. What about the others? The honorable members for White Bay wondered whether there was any process of the revival of the frequent with cannabis for the house of the And no exception was taken to the amount of the bounty on pineapples. Order. Order. And of course the order button shuts them up. Okay. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, so, you know, really just what I wanted to emphasize was 
uh, you know, how once we get these these large bodies of text in a, a nicely structured, usable form, what the sorts of possibilities that become available? Um, you know, from everything from that sort of just having all the text on a nice page for you to read through to having stupid stuff like RoboHansard or for doing that, you know, real, you know, quite interesting work on analysing language over time. And just imagine if we can go beyond a particular country, so Australia in this case, and start to do those sorts of language comparisons across countries, you know, from the where we're getting, you know, Hansard for UK, uh, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and hopefully soon South Africa. Imagine being able to do those analyses of political language across those different countries. I think there's some really exciting possibilities there. So um, that's it. I hope you have a great conference. Uh, thanks very much. See ya.